I am Daniel Lucas and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years and today I have my special guest. He is a recycled computer geek and of course award-winning author. He's the author of several books, no other than Mr. Michael Picard. Good to be with you. Welcome to Book 101, Mr. Michael, and can you please introduce yourself? Well, uh, so uh, I've uh, been an author since uh, 1993. My first book came out five years later in 1998. Uh, I write um, science fiction and detective mystery. Uh, I have 10 books on the market, and I have four more in the pipeline. Looking forward for uh, more and more books to come, Mr. Michael. So what initial steps should one take to begin the process of writing a book? Well, uh, for me, it's really important that I'm committed to any particular book. Uh, writing a book is difficult. Uh, it takes a long time, takes a lot of effort. And some people will undertake writing a book, but their heart and their head won't be in it. And so after a while, they lose the urge to complete the book, uh, which is really a shame. So before I start, I pick uh, a story that I, I am committed to both intellectually and emotionally. And that will carry me through typically uh, about a year and a half to two year process to complete the manuscript. How important is the outlining before diving into the writing the first draft? Uh, so for me, it's all about preparation. Uh, I use National Novel Writing Month as a tool to help me quickly get the story out of my head and into the computer. Uh, and in order to do that in the month of November, I spent at least a month and a half creating an outline. I've been thinking about the story earlier in the year uh, and uh, creating little sticky notes and putting them in a folder. But uh, for that month and a half, I'm sorting the sticky notes. I'm doing research on uh, the time period or inventing a time period, if it's a sci-fi novel. And uh, I put everything together so that during the 30 days of NaNoWriMo, I won't have to stop and answer questions that pop up. I will already know what the characters are like. I will know the location where the action is taking place. Uh, if it's in the future, I will know what technology they're using. If it uh, dates back a few years, I will know what things are real and what things have not yet been invented. And so I, I try very hard to make sure that my stories are accurate as, fa as far as facts are concerned. Very well said, Mr. Michael. So what techniques can help in developing compelling and believable characters? So, uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do as I mature in my writing is to have my stories more and more character based as opposed to plot based. Uh, in my early books, I would lay out a plot and I would try to force my characters to do what I wanted them to do according to my layout. And what I found was that in the process of dumping the story out of my brain, my characters would revolt. Uh, they would talk to me and tell me that, that the things that I'm asking them to do, in fact, were not the things that they thought they should be doing. And I learned early on that if a character talks to you and you have that gift, you listen to them because they know the story better than you do. They're in the story, not outside the story. And so I go very deep 
in my characters. As an example, uh, for my latest novel, Creative Deductions Home Run, which was a finalist in the soon-to-be-famous Illinois contest, uh, I created the character of my detective, Nick Chasm. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that his personality and his experience was rich enough so that as he was faced with obstacles and frustrations, that putting those on the page based on his previous experiences and the kind of person he is would be credible. I wanted character. I wanted readers to believe uh, the emotions that I try to put on the page. Well done, Mr. Michael. So how does one choose the right setting for the story and why it is important? Um, so for my sci-fi stuff, uh, some of those take place on Earth. Uh, others take place on other planets or on spaceships. One of the four novels in the pipeline is set about 400 years in the future on a planet that uh, Earthlings have colonized. And with uh, 400 years between now and then, it, there's an opportunity in world building to come up with a lot of different uh, knock your socks off technologies that those characters uh, take advantage of, but don't think twice about because it's part of their world. Uh, in uh, the follow-on book to Creative Deductions Home Run, and that is the first of three volumes in a set. So they're not sequels to each other. It's all one large story, kind of like Lord of the Rings. Uh, Nick ends up in Las Vegas for much of the second novel. Uh, so, and, and that one is uh, Creative Deductions Double Play. Uh, that comes out in April. Uh, and he's following clues and he ends up in Las Vegas. Uh, and I chose Las Vegas uh, for a number of reasons. One, because it's a really glitzy city to talk about and lots of things go on there. Uh, also, because uh, the, the, I chose to, to have the bad guys there because uh, there's a lot of money that flows through Las Vegas, including illegal money. And uh, I wanted Nick not to be on his home turf. Uh, in Home Run, he's, uh, he travels between Chicago, where he lives, and the town of Eden Gorge, uh, which is up near Rockford, Illinois, uh, and it was his hometown. But in the second book, he's in Las Vegas. He's kind of a fish out of water. He's not a gambler. He thinks that people who gamble are wasting their money. And so putting him in an uncomfortable situation adds to his tension. And I hope that comes through in the words. So, Mr. Michael, what are the effective ways to build a plot that keeps readers engaged from beginning to end? Well, uh, if uh, I'm doing character-oriented stories, then the reaction of the characters uh, to situations that uh, cross their path are uh, hopefully the the thing that carries the reader from uh, uh, chapter to chapter. And I do try to make sure that at the end of a chapter, there is uh, a, a small cliffhanger uh, so that uh, the reader is compelled to turn that page to the next chapter. Uh, for the three volume set of creative deductions, each book has an accomplishment. Nick does achieve something at the end of each book. So the reader has uh, something that they can uh, take away. But the, the end of the book always leaves something undone. So uh, at the end of volume one, there's still something that Nick hasn't done. And uh, at the end of volume two, uh, he has something that he knows in his heart he has to do which propels the reader to volume three.
Interesting audio books, Mr. Michael. But before we go on, we I want to shout out to the people listening according to my ranking tops in the last 30 days. Because in Bhutan, I got number six on the Apple chart. Taiwan at 34, Jamaica 42, Cameroon at 61, Thailand at 97, Cambodia 111, South Africa 115, and a lot more. Thank you so much for supporting this podcast. Because this podcast is created in power writers all over the world like Mr. Michael Pickard. So, Mr. Michael, let's talk about your latest book, Creative Deduction, Home Run. How did you craft it? Uh, so, uh, I had been doing uh, science fiction novels and I had nine of them on the market. And I noticed that in the last three of them, the protagonist, who was not a detective or a little old lady in a small town who uh, helped the police figure out crimes, uh, but the protagonists were uh, dealing with things that I thought of as clues. Uh, And I thought, okay, if... uh, there's a bit of detective in each of my protagonists in these sci-fi novels. Do I have the skill to craft uh, a a real detective story? And so I decided I was going to, I went for a walk with my wife. We live uh, maybe a mile from Lake Michigan. And uh, I said, you read a lot of detective stories. What are the best kinds of detective stories that you read? And she said, well, I really like ones where there are multiple crimes and the detective figures out that the crimes are related. And I thought, okay, that's a pretty good goal. And so uh, I decided that in Creative Deductions Home Run, there would be two murders. Uh, Both of them are covered up as uh, suicides. They happen to take place within... Uh, a few hours of each other and uh, in the vicinity of Nick's hometown, Eden Gorge. Uh, So Nick is working a drug bust. His mother, who's 82 years old and still lives in Eden Gorge, calls him in the middle of the arrest and says, my 80-year-old male companion died in a traffic accident. I think uh, that he was murdered. I want you to come up here and solve the crime and put the bad guy in jail. Uh, He doesn't believe that she knows it's murder. uh, And he had never heard of her hanging out with an 80-year-old male companion, which is a bit of a shock. Uh, He doesn't really want to go home because his deceased father was also a cop. But through circumstances, and I'll let your uh, listeners uh, buy the book to figure out that part of uh, Nick's background. But he tries to avoid his hometown. It brings back bad memories. Uh, oh. He tries to get his commanding officer to um, uh, say, no, you can't have the time off. Uh, but unfortunately, the commander says, oh, no, go help your mother. And so reluctantly, he drives up on his motorcycle to see his mother uh, and he's immediately caught up in uh, the first of two deaths and very shortly thereafter learns about a second death uh, within a few hours. And uh, he's, uh, he's the kind of cop who isn't going to let go when he has two murders on his plate. So even though he's not in Chicago, outside of his jurisdiction as a policeman, he takes on both cases. Interesting novel, Mr. Michael. So, how did you ensure the book's theme or is uh, the book creative deduction is clearly communicated and impactful? Um, so, uh, I guess being chosen as a finalist in the soon to be famous Illinois contest. Uh, tells me that uh, I have matured in my writing skills. Uh, Otherwise, I I wouldn't have made the finals. Uh, 
And, and that was really a, 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 a pat on the back. I, I, I felt like I had achieved something special uh, by uh, becoming one of the finalists. Uh, because, Congratulations. Thank you. Because of uh, the fact that I have this deep knowledge of Nick and it's very easy for me to write Nick. And I, I, I write those three, I'm writing those three novels in first person. Uh, we're very close to Nick. Uh, and uh, I, I hope, and, and I think from feedback I've gotten, uh, I think all seven of my reviews on Amazon are all five star uh, that I'm, I'm getting uh, Nick's emotions on the page. I'm getting uh, people caught up in uh, him and the secondary characters. And uh, I've learned that pe that readers uh, get really caught up in the stories and they have very definitive attitudes about the characters in the story. Uh, it's not just they're reading a book and they're going to put it down. There's something about the, the characters that are hooking them. And, and that's the best thing a writer can do. Definitely. What role does research play in enhancing the authenticity or authenticity of creative deduction? Uh, so for all my novels, uh, I do a lot of research. In fact, uh, there were some things that were in one of my novels. It took me a week to research it, and it only affected two lines of the novel. But I wanted to understand uh, the nature of that fact, uh, so that in fact it was authentic, that if someone went to the trouble of looking it up, uh, they would find that, uh, I had been honest and truthful in portraying that real thing. Uh, but I, I go to, uh, a lot of trouble with research. Uh, one of the novels I'm working on that I did last November, takes place uh, at the University of Wyoming. And uh, so I have found people at the university, uh, people on staff and students who are willing to take my phone calls and talk to me about the university. Uh, one guy is an assistant head of the athletic department. Another is a young woman who works in their public relations office. And uh, they've been very kind to take photos of places describe things for me, look things up. Uh, so I use the, the standard uh, internet tools. Uh, I do uh, Google Street View and I do Google Earth uh, and I you know, research things on Wikipedia. Um, but I also try to go to human sources. Um, when I was planning Creative Deductions Home Run, I found and interviewed two different police officers. Uh, to understand police procedurals. I spoke to a lawyer to understand uh, what the courtroom scenes would be like and what an arrest is like. So uh, in one of my novels, uh, One Photo Too Many, there is a dissection of a sea creature. And I found someone who gave me the guide to how someone would do a dissection of a deceased porpoise. Uh, and I use that as an outline for one of my chapters. And in critique, no one ever challenged the, the factual basis uh, in, that ch um, in that chapter because it was authentic, because they, they believed uh, my translation from that user manual. So I, I do a lot of research. Lots of research, people. So how would you effectively manage Facing to maintain reader interest throughout the book? Um, well, so I, I learned early on that uh, you don't want to surprise a reader at the end with something that has not been substantiated earlier in the novel. So you have to do appropriate foreshadowing. And uh, I guess I'm playing a little game with my readers that if they get to the end and there's that aha moment, number one, I've earned that moment by appropriately foreshadowing. But if the reader goes back and says, 
how did we get here? They will find the breadcrumbs that will lead them through the novel. And uh, hopefully they say there, there were clues that either I got or missed that if I had been more perceptive in my reading, I would have figured out that this is where it would have ended. So uh, I, I don't make it a guessing game. That, that's not the point. Uh, but I do want the readers to uh, read deeply and not casually, because if they read casually, they're, they're going to miss stuff. And that stuff is there. I make sure it is. Very well said, Mr. Michael. But before we go on, I'm inviting you to please do visit my website, my food 101, www.food101.ca, because this is my official website of Food 101. And I'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast, Food 101, on our fourth season with Chef Alessandro one of the best executive chefs in one of five-star restaurants in downtown Toronto. Please do listen to our ep- latest episode. We talk about lasagna, people, lasagna. And not only uh, that, our books are out. Not only one, but 13 volumes, people. They are available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. So, Mr. Michael, let's do read some of your reviews. And according to Robert J. Rome, Home Run is just that. How would you comment for that, Mr. Michael? Uh, well, so I did tell you that every chapter has uh, a cliffhanger in it. And so the natural tendency is for the reader to say, uh, I, need to, I need to know what happens next. I, I, I don't want to have to wait for uh, uh, two hours from now to, to come back and pick it up. So uh, it, it warms my heart that someone got into the story so deep that uh, they, they couldn't put the book down. Yes, indeed. And according to Contic 053, Great Murder Mystery. Oh, awesome characters. The mystery kept me guessing until the end. So how did you form all your characters? Is it easy for you to name them? Um, so uh, my sister is my contributing editor. Uh, and... Uh, Writing is a very solitary process. Uh, I sit in my office uh, and uh, uh, my butt in the chair, my fingers on the keys, and I, I write. But uh, I don't know if it's the same for all writers, but I need to be able to uh, have conversations with people, bounce ideas off of somebody. Uh, that kind of uh, community uh helps me. I, I do it with uh, critique groups uh, and ideation groups, and I do it with my sister, Cheryl. So uh, she and I collaborate. Uh, she is great with names. Uh, and if I tell her that I need uh, a character uh, uh, of a certain style, uh, almost instantaneously, she will come up with a, a biography of that character. What's interesting is she does that without looking at the outline of the book. And so she's building these characters. And the, the benefit to me is that as I'm crafting the outline uh, with these characters in mind, uh, if I know them well enough, then I am closer to a character-driven novel because I can use the backgrounds that she has invented to uh, uh, affect uh, the character's behavior in the book. And so it, it's really kind of a, a well, it, it is a collaboration, uh, but she, she learns from me, I learn from her. Uh, and uh, she is also 
an intermediate editor between my two critique groups. Uh, so she keeps me honest. Wow, what a good collaboration. And according according to Mr. Michael T, what a page, what a page turner. Creative Deduction Home Run by Michael Pickard is an absolute gem of a mastery novel that deserves nothing less than five-star rating. Indeed, congratulations, Mr. Michael. And how do you decide on the narrative point of view and what impact does this have in the story of this book? Well, uh, I've, I've done books in uh, third person, close third, uh, and I've done books in first person. I'm having more success in getting emotions on the page with first person than with close third. Uh, because what I found was in close third, I was including lots of italicized thoughts of the character. Uh, in fact, too many of those. And uh, people in critique groups uh, had pointed that out. So to get out from under all of that italicized text, uh, I decided, and it was an easy decision, uh, to make the Creative Deductions series uh, up close and personal with the detective Nick Chasm. Very well said, Mr. Michael. So what is tragedies that can help you to overcome writer's block during the writing process of creative deductions? So... Uh, this may sound a little radical, but I do not believe that writing block exists. Uh, and there's a couple of different circumstances. In fact, I, I was interviewed for a blog about uh, a writer's block uh, where I went into detail. I'll try to do this quickly. Uh, if someone sits down at a screen and the screen has a blank piece of paper on it, and they don't know what to write, that's not writer's block. They haven't come up even with an idea yet. So they need to work on their ideation skills, their what if skills to come up with a story idea that from my perspective has to be near and dear to their heart and their mind. Uh, if they're writing along and they come to a, a spot where uh, they don't know what to write next. Uh, my recommendation is pretty simple. You're in the middle of a story. You have a character. There's only a finite number of things that character can do. So write them down. And then look at each of them and evaluate which of them uh, takes the story in the direction you want. Maybe one of the things they choose to do uh, takes them on a bad path uh, that raises uh, tension in the story. One of them uh, gives them smooth sailing, but uh, there's no tension in smooth sailing. Uh, my very first novel, the primary character uh, wanted to do something. They just did it and nothing got in their way. Uh, it, it's, it's not, there's no tension in the story, but it was written to my daughter when she was, uh, between the ages of 11 and 14. Uh, so my, my audience was not as sophisticated. Uh, and there's some things that people can do easily if they're writing and they're done for the day. Uh, don't stop writing when you don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, have in your mind what the next thing would be that you would write down if you were going to continue writing. Make a quick note of that and then turn the computer off. When you come back, your momentum will be easy to regain because you took those notes about what comes next. And so you can uh, start back into it uh, without hesitation. Who don't want to make a decision. And I would urge them to make the decision and keep writing. 
interesting thought about writer's block. And thank you for your thoughts about that. What are the key consideration in revising and editing the creative deduction while you're writing it? Um, so I depend heavily in my process uh, to get outside eyes to look at my manuscripts, my chapters. Um, my chapters go through two different critique groups, one chapter at a time. Uh, and that gives them, uh, the other people in the group, a chance to focus on, I don't know, maybe 2,000, uh, at most 3,000 words. Uh, it's out of context. It's, it's standalone. They may or may not have remembered from last week what happened before this. Uh, but I'm good, getting good feedback on the words on the page. Uh, and then uh, my sister is my intermediate editor, and then it goes through a second uh, group uh, that also sees the chapters, but in uh, the quantity of words they see per month is greater. So they see more the bigger chunks. Uh, in that process, I'm getting... Uh, probably a total of a dozen different perspectives on the work. Uh, and that's really important because sitting in a chair, I only have one perspective, me. Uh, but if 12 people get to look at this and tell me their reactions to some of the words, uh, words that uh, uh, are uh, would be better off if I substituted something else or... Uh, something that doesn't follow from previous stuff, uh, then uh, those are really valuable insights. But that's not enough because when the manuscripts are complete after the second uh, round of uh, critique, uh, I package them up. I do another edit where I read it front to back. Uh, and a lot of things come out of reading a, a complete novel, uh, things that you wouldn't have recognized by looking at it chapter by chapter. And then I have two separate teams of beta readers. Uh, so for example, Creative Deductions, uh, Double Play, the next novel in the series, has gone through the first round of beta readers. Uh, and I got lots of great feedback and I've done a bunch of edits and I have sent it out to the second team of beta readers. Uh, and when I get that feedback, I'll do another round of edits and then uh, because eventually you have to stop editing. Uh, uh, that book will uh, join Home Run uh, on Amazon. Congratulations again, Mr. Michael. And thank you, Feedspot, for being the number two best book podcast on the planet. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Michael, can you please invite our listeners to support all your books? Uh, so I, I think it would be worthwhile for your listeners to visit my author page on Amazon. Uh, I have a simple uh, URL that you can use. It is www.gerfnit, spelled G-E-R, F as in Frank, N-I-T, dot com. And that will take you to the front page of my Amazon uh, author site. Uh, I would invite them to read the blurbs on the back covers and ask themselves, is this a story you might want to read? Uh, they're all available in paperback. They're all available in Kindle ebook. And Creative Deductions Home Run is available more broadly on uh, Apple Books and uh, every place else that you can you can get uh, an ebook. So uh, th they're out there. Uh, and uh, I, I think the they're worth a look see. Yes, people, let's support Mr. Michael Pickard. Because if you support him, more, more, more books to come. Uh, Mr. Michael, thank you for your time. But thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. More to come, people. See you soon.